asking for more financial resources and more support for her to get the other campaign, and also to help the tough to keep the new mob in run, and two thirds of his audience stood up. So since then, he's been on Khan on and we haven't heard too much of him, except for recently a couple of different, different uh, communicates stating his position on different things that are going on since then. So, like I, I, I was, I had a graphic for this today, but um, to basically explain the political uh, hierarchy of, of Mexico's government or the system in which it works, you have on the top layer, you have so many puppet masters who most of the time are invisible, controlling the Fed. Between the Fed and state, local governments are even, and even lobbying this, just a really big corrupt bureaucracy. Then you have, drop down off of that, you have your state and local governments, and then Perspective, take layer of bureaucracy. So the puppet masters in this situation, since the installment of this president, uh, main main prerogative was to use the system, which in in, in the case of it were to be socialized uh, production, use the system of federalization and nationalization that Mexico has used throughout the years with with different corporate and, um, and material resource management to put it under control of the federal government, took a big hit, or, or, or took a big swing, at uh, the biggest union in Mexico, which is the SME, which is the, electrics, the electricians union, and closed down the largest electric, the electricity company in Mexico, which is Luzi Fuerza del Centro, which, can, which at one point controlled all of the electrical works in the central part of Mexico. Um, this, Automatic, and when this wasn't done by by Senate decision by Congress. This was done by presidential decree. And this presidential decree that put over a hundred thousand workers out of the job from one day to the next. So at this period, we did see in Mexico City we did see large protests, um, good organizing uh, on the part of the workers themselves, and a lot of different other groups trying to kind of hover around and see which direction it can be pushed into or whatnot. Um, the biggest campaign during this was that by, by law, the company now that stepped in to take over control of, of the electric industry, the Federal Commission of Electricity, didn't have a legal right to charge without taking the measurement of electricity at the house, without checking the meter. So the big campaign during this time was to get out uh, people to sign um, that are, I don't know, you might call it a waiver or, uh, yeah, like a waiver to uh, not pay their, their light bill during this time. So hundred, almost hundreds of thousands in support of this stopped paying their light bill and the CFB hurried to install new meters where they had to and to employ more people in order to check meters to get everyone paying again. So at this time, um, the light went down since they couldn't check the meters, they were they were guesstimating and sending really low bills, which later took an effect on all of the public because you have 300% um, gain or 300% difference between your last month's phone bill and, or electricity bill and this month's electricity bill. But um, the thing that really, that the government knew when this happened is that every, for every worker, since they were unionized, they had to pay a liquidation. And so they gave them a period of a year and a half, close to a year and a half, for them to go and to, and to get their liquidation paid out. Now the government knew as long as they could, the more they could wait, the more people would say, well, if I don't take my liquidation, then I don't have anything to live, up, live on. So the, that movement has been dwindling down and down. And now what you have is more than 100,000 workers, you have maybe two or 3,000 workers holding down that company. This is a common trend of, of the neoliberalism agenda, uh, the same thing is being pushed for in the, the petroleum industries, oil, in order to sell off all, all, the, um, all the, the once nationalized or once federalized companies into private hands and over everything to have access to fiber optics. So, um, where I wrote this, uh, map-wise, you can picture Mexico, um, Um, in the middle you have Mexico City, which is a central hotspot for, 
for workers' rights movements, you have you can go out and go to a different protest every day if you want. You have you have you might have ten people, you might see a couple thousand people. In in southern Mexico, instead of Chiapas, you have the city of San Cristobal de las Casas, which is basically the neo hippie neo left neo ecologist movement within Mexico that has strong ties to what's left of uh, or or actually what's what's growing up. Uh, the Zapatista networking, we have that as their front base in the world. Uh, hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of volunteers coming through there every year to work on, on different sustainability projects, uh, political projects that keep on getting the word out to the Zapatistas and try to defend that campaign. As a friend of mine likes to say, if San Cristobal de las Casas is like the paradise of, of social, of left work, of, of revolutionary work, of, of good left work, then Chiapas is this hell. Chiapas has been for the second consecutive year now the most violent city in the world. So more than Fallujah, or more than Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, wherever you want to put yourself in the world, Chiapas by next door is the most dangerous. And during the last last year, 2010 had more than 3,000 deaths. Um, the, the numbers, the, justice, the numbers for justice or, or impunity in this case, or in single, or single digits for justice, and just skyrocketing for impunity. Um, and this is basically due to the neoliberalism model that had been used since even before the formulation of NAFTA had been applied to CRPIs, even as at an experimental grounds to see how exactly business can be done in the most lucrative way for the capitalist part or the capitalist class and and just fuck people over. I don't think. But anyways, uh, so I go back. If you take Chiapas before Las Vegas was what Las Vegas is now, Chiapas was was party central, right? Before even people going to to La Habana and Cuba, you know, you have Chiapas as a central for uh, the version of entertainment in North America. When you have, when you start uh, after after a few years, you have the U.S. Uh, declaring prohibition against alcohol. That's when Juarez gets set up as a central point, trafficking point for contraband. And now during this time, you have an hey economic heyday in Juarez where they're sending alcohol or people are coming there just to drink. You have celebrities like Marilyn Monroe visiting you have Kennedy visiting Chiapas, you know, just the likes of anyone, uh, that was the place to be, right? Um, so you have this boom that then turns into business in Chiapas. And if you go to Chiapas and you go to the airport, if you come out of the airport, you see a sign that says, welcome to the city of business. So and this, you have a huge boom, and from, from 50s on, based on the entertainment, the so many of the entertainment values of the town. Uh, later on in the, the late 60s and into the 70s, you start seeing, seeing uh, the, the building of, of, fac of factories for maquiladoras or sweatshop factories for component materials. So components for electronics, for, for auto parts, basically whatever you can think of. You see this boom. So, since the 70s or even before you see seen Chiapas say, okay, well here there's constant construction. You might even go so far and say, well, there's always something being built. But if you look behind that, then you see that everything is built like a movie set. You got drywall, your cheapest materials to put up, the quickest factories you can to make as much money as you can before either someone gets mad about it, or the market goes down, or workers try to ask for rights and then Get out of there, and with no cost to you, move someplace else. The more exploited you live. So during this time period in the in the 60s on, um, you see one of the most vanguard cities in in women's rights, women working rights, because you see one of the only places that has more of a population of working working women than working men. This was a place where women from all over Mexico, or even all over different countries in Latin America, 
would go saying, I can work, I can make my own money, I can live by myself, and not have to depend on the classic model of depending on a man and a woman being in a household or whatnot. We see this as a diverse city for that. So there's an enormous influx of women into the city. Now, at this point, because of the boom in business, you can see that that with the entertainment, and you can see the industries of prostitution spring up, and you can see also people that are just so rich that say, well, I can go to Seattle Bodies and I can get my rocks off killing the girl, and now you never have anything to do with it. You know, you've got these sick people too, mixed all in this, this lovely bundle of, of constant money. Also from this point on, you see, Seattle Bodies is one of the only cities in the world with an unemployment rate of They had to go out into different parts of the Republic just to recruit people to go work in Seattle. Huge boom. Now, as you can see, if, if this is neoliberalism and experimentation, well, then when a crisis comes, if this is the front line, I mean, you can see GMC taking a hit back east and, and bouncing back in three months. Federal protection is the most protected within the system. This is the front line of the neoliberalist capitalist society. It's going to take the first direct hit. From that huge boom, where so many houses and so many residents were populated, you have, in Seattle Bodies, you have one in four houses abandoned. You have two of every four houses without water because of the last winter that this happened, of course, all the pipes. And the speculation on plumbing supplies was so high that no one could afford to buy it. You have constant closures of, of the factories, and you have people now either having to turn into the illegal market or move out of Seattle. So, and then all this compares on a national situation in Mexico because for the longest time, for over 75 years, the rule, there was only one ruling party, which was the institutionalized revolution. And their goal after the Mexican Revolution was to institutionalize the changes that everyone wanted to see during the revolution. This led it evolved into corruption, the buying for power, into coercion from drug, with the drug traffickers. And so you see this, this rupture where you have the party that has all the, all the, all the, uh, all the strings in line, you know, all the ducks in the row, got everyone's cards, knows how to play every one of them to make everything work and be peaceful. Now you have a, or be somewhat, get the illusion of peace, let's say. But you have a party then, the, final, the National Action Party, which is big business. You got um, CEOs, business owners, executives, and they come into power and they say, okay, well, if we're buying for legal money, and the other party's got their rocks off, get, or getting their money handled over this and whatever market, well, then there's going to be a clash for market share. So if you see in Mexico, if you take a look at the, 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 the main states that are, that are having problems with violence and drug war, are states that are ruled by that party. And specifically because that party is more interested in and only playing their odds with one group of uh, drug, drug traffickers and narcos and the other in order to strip uh, electricity, fiber optics, telecommunication, and oil into the hands of corporate bidders. So all the, all the plans you can see, uh, plan, plan Puebla, Panama, Plan Merida, are all securing the, the Caribbean side, the east side, Mexico for the exportation of all raw materials, including oil. Now, I used to quote yesterday, and I still don't know, I haven't memorized the quote last night. Uh, Rosa Luxemburg says that when, when democratic tools, or, or you, and she referred to parliament, says when parliamentarism or, or the tools of democracy tend to negate their class quality, then they're off by the ruling party. And you can see that in, in the US in the case of the Patriot Act, or, but in, in Mexico, you can see it as the most democratic tool that any citizen in Mexico has to use against the government is 
found within the bureaucracy. So if the bureaucracy is now, now not available to them, then they have to look for an alternative within a movement. And if you look at it in Mexico economically, the economic alternatives are to these bourgeois tools that are given within the so-called democracy, their alternative is piracy. And if you look at it in, in the terms of, of so social economic reasoning in Chuck Juarez or Durango or now even in Morelos and some of the southern states, well, the alternative to a legal market is the drug market, the extortion racket, the economy. And if you look at it politically, where you normally go looking for help with these unions, the unions are, unions that often have corrupt officials, are getting sold out, are getting undersold. And so Mexico's alternative right now is precisely in, or, or where a rupture can come for the class consciousness would be at a level of, of being denied help by the same bureaucracies that are in play to, to help them in civil affairs. So in Juarez, you have a family of uh, the Reyes Salazar family has been protest protesting against uh, the drug war and the violence in Ciudad Juarez since they lost one family, the first family group. Since they're protesting and because they're being hurt, they've lost 12 more families. Now 29 of their family have ha had to ask for asylum in the U.S. In Ciudad Juarez, you have, uh, in the case of Susana Chavez, was killed on January 6th of this year. She was a woman, a poet. Uh, 36 years, 36 years old, and what she did in order to provoke this great hatred for her enough to kill her was to start a campaign that said, "Ni una más, not one more." Now, her using this her prowess as a poet launched this campaign that took that took flight in Mexico and all over the nation, even internationally, and she was killed, and the hand she cut and that she she wrote with was cut off. So this is sending a message against all segments. And when you see it in, in Ciudad Juarez, you see the history of, with the drug war escalating about five years ago. You see that first people were like, okay, well this is just an adjustment between two different cartels. And as soon as the adjustment takes place and it's over, then everything will go back to normal and we'll all be safe. Now in Villa de Sabaca, last year, there was a massacre of about, I think it was 16 people, if I'm not mistaken who were kids, university students who had just come home from watching a game, from one of the university games, who went to the, one of the homes of uh, their friends to celebrate the victory. And, and um, an armed group of men broke into their house and massacred. So the people in Ciudad Juarez just start saying, oh, well, this isn't just between two cartels. This is affecting us. So when, at that time, they say, okay, well, bring in the army. And they welcome the army in the, into their town with open arms. But the thing is, when you bring in a, a, a force that doesn't know the area, and doesn't know the people there, then what you're doing is creating a hostile environment. Because you don't know if she's a drug runner or she's just a girl at a university student. Or you don't know if he's just, a, just another guy at the street corner of the store or if he's laundering money, you know? So you bring in this, this force, and now, even uh, you see a level, you see the different levels, the caps of, of corruption going on, from better, from municipal level police enforcement to federal level of police enforcement to the, uh, to the military level of, of enforcement. And even the, the people, like we've had uh, a protest, a, a boy was killed, 15 year old boy was killed right on the Rio Grande, which is now just a small channel of water, killed on the Mexican side by a, a U.S. immigration agent. During the protest, there was one civilian man saying that he would protect the protesters with the rifle that he brought and struck against the immigration agents that were fine. Later on, the police, the, the very uh, police that's, that's wreaking havoc in certain areas of the city, came and said, well, we've got you back against the media, and let them protest for another half hour. When the Reyes Salazar case, the, the 
last three members were killed, the family went on a hunger strike and took the plaza in front of the, the justice building. When the protest was going down and the bodies were finally found, the cops came out and even though the protesters were at, at the first moment yelling at the police and telling them that they were part of the problem, the, the police came and said, look, we're off the clock and our weapons are at your disposal. We're here to stay. So when you can see that this, this, economic, this economic and social economic situation just blows up and turns really bad, that these different levels are going to re, that's where the, the class consciousness begins to shift. Regrouping into, okay, who's the front that we actually want to take this to on this activity? And um, so the question that the, the group that I work with in Mexico when we go around Mexico talking about the situation in Ciudad Juarez is that if you don't know what's happening in Ciudad Juarez, then how can you prevent that? So this, start, this can start out. Juarez can be another spot where it's just like, okay, at first there's just an escalation in violence. The weather is oppressive there. So we have to take consciousness. In all of, in all of Mexico, this situation in Juarez that's been going on for the past five years or even more is being reduced. And so this is moving down into Durango, into Michoacan, into the outskirts of Mexico City, and even into the south. And Regarding the violence is that, the, and I mentioned it, this is why I mentioned it, is that one of the main things that contributed to Wise was as an experiment, as an experimentation ground is um, the School of America. And one of the right man, right hand man of Hitler was Himmler. And he, his student was Michael Lipkins. And he was the one that founded the PSYOP project of the Americas, which basically came to the conclusion that in order to create soldiers or, or, or subordinates that were capable of carrying out any order, then they would have to be subjugated to activities that would erase their moral balance. And so those, those acts would include raping, torture, killing, maiming. And that right, combined with with the escalation of just chaos, of this boom of, of economic violence in, in Hawaii, just created an uh, absolute playground of violence. And at one time, the FBI stated that there was nine serial killers in, in Chiang Hawaii, and there was 12 copycats. So when you see this on a, on a personal level, on a day-to-day -day level, you think, okay, this is violence. When you watch, you watch also, you see programs on TV where, where all they're talking about, okay, there's, there's this problem going on and these cops are going to solve it and this problem and this, and you see them as individual cases. But when you see, when, when the people start seeing this as systematic, and that's when you know, when you realize who your base is, who's in the same boat, that's the type of class consciousness that's being created, that you say. being conscious of the class consciousness is being created because when you can, when, when it can be immediately prioritized or categorized as an individual, which is the forte of the capitalist system is to divide us all into thinking that we're all these individuals, right? But when you see it and you say, okay, the cops are in the same boat, the cops are getting stepped on by the same people that are stepping on the town. They're all getting stepped on by the military and they're not just killing them all anyways. So you gotta have, then you start asking, well, who's in the same boat? And 
and that's where we've seen in a lot of in a lot of cases with whether it be um, the people that are that are waking up to this this reality in Sri Lanka, or the, the electric workers, or the fishermen from Barracuda. They all know that that's where when when the conflict begins, and they all know that that collective collectively fighting these problems are is a much better way, and that's where that can be be implemented. Well, I mean, you mentioned the sort of atrocities that are going on to establish the new liberal free market capitalism in a sense. Um, and this funny thing happens when all this violence happens is a lot of people are really rich. And in fact, most of the richest people in Hawaii actually live in Mexico. So I was wondering what if you could address sort of, I mean, where the money is going, like, well, I'm not sure, like, what companies are actually benefiting the most in Mexico, and how many of those are actually American corporations? Centralizing agenda for the money making has been in, in place since Salinas. And Salinas de Gordiari was president of Mexico three terms ago. And basically, he, through a lot of uh, backdoor deals and by floating the, the Mexican peso, was able to just steal like billions of dollars out of the Mexican economy. And Namesake for Salinas in Mexico today is Carlos Slim, which is the richest man in the world. And so, Carlos Slim fortune is backed by control of the telecommunication markets from Mexico south. Even got a good piece of, got, got a good piece of the US. So, in Mexico, it's Telmex, Telcel. And which is the, the main telephone line, um, the regular house line, and Telcel, which is your cell phone company. You got control of the telephone lines and Telcel and cellular companies in Guatemala, in most of the Central American companies in Colombia, in, yeah, in Chile. So the, the big fight right now between oil or between the profits that are being made off of oil, they're not going to oil, oil, been nationalized in Mexico for the longest time. But the economic advisors, and I would like to think that they're from the US on this one, but uh, said, well, it, it's better for you not to pull out your own oil, subcontract to, to American companies. And so then they tell them, okay, well, it'd actually be better for you not even to refine your oil. You know, send it to us, we'll refine it, we'll send it back to you. So for every one peso that's spent on oil in Mexico, the government receives eight cents. So the only refiners that they have is diesel, and the refined material is worth more on the market internationally than it is nationally. So it gets sold at the same price as it does internationally. So between the oil and the fiber optics and the richest man in the world being a Mexican in control of telecommunications, well, it's control of fiber optics. And fiber optics has to do and overlays with the with the petroleum industry because it has to go underwater, has to go through oil bitten places. And so the, the two controls, to who controls those two factors right now is controlling the whole of not only Mexico's economy and political situation, but um, of, of most of Latin America's political situation. Um, Going back, taking a step back with the, with the question of violence, um, the WikiLeaks on Mexico from the Mexican Embassy or the U.S. Embassy in Mexico point to Calderon's, the president of Mexico, strategizing as to how to create violence in the city of Mexico in order to create a state of, of, of exception under martial law, very similar to what happened post September 11th for the first little while, to annul the, the, the future presidential election create a military dictatorship. If this happens, it will be a coup that will most affect most mostly affect the public and none of the upper layers of, of Mexican economy. Now during the drug wars, because um, 
routes are very important to the different cartels because you have three or four different cartels uh, with a different international ties, every one of them, and some of them make moving in not only coastally in the, in the south, but in, through over the overland. So with this, because Mexico is the back patio to the U.S., you, you see it as a constant that anyone from Central or South America is going to have to go through Mexico to get to the U.S. Now, since this is all very pretty, um, a group like the Setas or Luis Cosquín is named on the Setas, the American Um These immigrants are being kidnapped, and when they find one that doesn't have even a remote chance of paying any type of ransom, then they're either sold off as slave workers or product or into prostitution, into sweatshops.
And so then we could ask, we could start asking them, well, what can we do? Well, we know all the problems that are happening to our body, so let's try to work on that. Now, when the virus started, started um, really escalating after the mask came out in South Africa, um, the government, the federal government came in and started saying, okay, well, yeah, that's right, cultural program. And what we were doing months before, the, the government finally got rid of us and said, okay, we're going to invest a lot of money, we're going to put in some soccer fields, some, some cultural centers, whatever, right? Basically, you throw in money at the problem, and it didn't work. So the soccer fields that they put in, still in abandoned, or there's actually a massacre of one of the soccer fields that they put in, uh, cultural centers abandoned or eventually run out of their budget. And so after that, after our program was being most effective from the ground up, some of the members were threatened. And some of them, fearing for their lives, decided to take the show on the road and expanded what was a collective into community. And so the community that I work with is, is Barrio Loma, is um, free media. So we do, or try to do, one radio show and one television show per week over internet. And we also do uh, news stories, um, reading, reading groups virtually, uh, promote writing, art, and culture. But what we do is uh, most of our members are from Chihuahua, and everyone gets around hitching rides. So we tour all over Mexico, and we go in and we kind of hook up with people that we already know, or, or people that might send us an email and we can go and say, okay, what are you guys doing? Kind of get a look at what they're doing. And we hook up and we do our, our media, we do our radio, we do our TV. And so in this exchange, what happens is why we've got our, our, our supporters and our viewers and our, and our listeners that every time we go to a new place accumulate, you know, so they listen to us and they, they just know another group is doing something else. Right? They just say, oh, you know, they're doing something interesting. I can get on the internet, check out their site and see if they can help me with this. But at the same time, we just promote everyone we're going to and ask them also about what they're doing on the Quad. So we do this networking and communication by using um, basically media presentation over a network to be able to, to and, and by doing so in a non-tendency form and a non, uh, you know, like say, okay, you, do, you guys do what you do, you can do that. We're not going to tell you what, how to do. You need a second suggestion. You can do that. You guys can be part of the community of, of urban artists of the movement and use our, our resources as well as offer your resources to be able to be part of. So, uh, the students in the, in the U.S., I think, I think are doing a really good job. People that are, are more, uh, or are either leaning or yeah, already on the left, know that the social networking and the communication, the telecommunications offer right now is, is really good. But the important thing right now is to establish solid connections with different organizations and create kind of a backup communication because as, as we say, the project we use is, is, is basically culturally a Trojan horse. So we say, okay, Gutenberg invented the press way back when and that was the first revolution of information. Because first of all, books that were stored in monasteries for years that no one had access to can now be printed in mass and distributed. So since then, there's always been a campaign to try to restrict that to keep information on the go, to keep people sort of uh, at a certain level of ignorance. Now with the internet, it's the second revolution of information. And since, since it's, it's inauguration or since it's, it's birth, there have been different agencies and different actors trying to control that. So as much as this is going on right now, if we don't have any concrete connections, then when they decide to pull the plug on our internet, then there's no more faithful. social communications, on, on getting to know other groups, and also to put it out there in different media presentations. I think a website, website is great and everything, but you also need to get into, you know, avoid the fact that you know, the videos, um, 
we are getting stuff into the radio station, since our, our radio programs online, on TV online, through video, different uh, graphic design, graphic media. I think this right now is the best way to kind of get different messages out. Uh, also, the uh, address of the website for the Alabama Surf Projects? Uh, the, the website is www.elcnk. Basically, um, there's two ways to get across. Either you braid it out yourself, or you go and you and hire a guy like Coyote, right? Um, the, with you can equate the Coyote as basically indentured servitude. So as as the same as indentured servitude would 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 work. Well, if I already have the money, here goes the money and take me over, right? No harm, no foul. But the people that don't have to are, yeah, either either going to be um, be thrown into um, being mules in order to get something across and, and paying their way in that way, or to agree to some sort of extortion after the fact um, once they're working in the U.S. to pay this obviously large sum of money. Now, the cartels, as it being one of their priorities or one of their, their, their principal businesses, it's not. But the thing is that the coyotes and all these people that are, are serving as guys and extortioners and exploiters pay up to the cartels. So the, car the cartels run their own extortion on top of them. So yeah, it's definitely related, but as far as being a principal see that, well, in Mexico has had a long history of running drugs ever since Prohibition. And extortion has never been one of the principal jobs of those narcos or those drug runners that are in the business. But when the government cracks down and says, well, we're not going to let you do business with the same thing as there's no jobs legally, then it ruins the legal market. If legally by moving drugs I don't have any jobs anymore, well, then I'm going to move into extortion. And that evolutionary process of Bad business happens. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I don't. I don't know. I, I just heard about. 
this as a rumor, and so I don't know if it's true. I wasn't really got any information. Um, I've heard through the grapevine that there's um, a lot of uh, American immigrants or like children of immigrants or like undocumented children um, who are Marxist Leninists or Maoists who are looking to start up actually a people's war in Mexico. Have you heard any traffic or anything on the grapevine about people coming down from the U.S. either armed or unarmed working to build specifically a fight against not just the government but the cartels? Well, I know. Um, I can imagine that there's some that would would be looking for that, or, or even some that come down and work with other groups that are established, but as far as a more guerrilla-style movement in that direction, uh, by foreigners, I don't think so. I know that there is, um, or that I have heard of, I haven't heard of, but I know that there are three or four, uh, say, FARC-style groups. Um, one is the FARC, which is the armed, Revolutionary People's Armed Forces, and either them or one other group is responsible for what Mexican government called terrorist acts, but were actually attacks on the oil pipeline that had no civilian casualties whatsoever. So basically, um, the group came out and said, "Well, it's not a terrorist act. There's no people involved. Basically, corporate sabotage or vandalism or whatnot." Um, more of the, some of the, the more um, militarized political groups in, in the north that still have ties and, and that are sons and daughters of, of some of the people, some of the people from the revolution in 1910, also have a, a strong armed wing. But as far as anyone making any action towards, towards any type of, of war or armed conflict, I haven't, haven't heard anything yet. But I will let you know and I'll send you a ticket. yesterday was if there was if there was more people joining groups or not. But what, what is more is is that there's there's more groups popping up, but there's less people joining core groups. So it's like a bunch of like bubbles, you know, um, small bubbles of groups. But there's not really any one particular group that would would encompass right now a political front or that would even ask for that. Party, but what happened was um, the Communist Party during the 40s was in its heyday, it had a ton of members and was very influential within the union and within the government under Cabinet. And what happened was there was kind of a, what's it, a symbological offing of the Communist Party when Trotsky was killed in Mexico City. So basically when um, the Communist Party was hold kind of the de facto responsible or responsible party for Trotsky's death, and the company, and the same president that invited Trotsky into the, into Mexico came out and said, "This crime is a crime of treason against the state." And in Mexico, the only the only crime that is punishable by death is treason. And so there was a, at that point there was kind of a symbolic uh, kind of a, a symbolical cut between government entities and bureaucratic entities, and in some cases even, even the unions with the Communist Party. And since, and since then it has, hasn't, been, hasn't been prohibited or even banned, just the fact that even in Mexico City, the CP's got maybe a total of five, six hundred people. So just no one's been able to get uh, an act together enough to such a big mass of people, and the only things, the only people that have been able to are, are the unions, and the only thing preventing is the unions, or even the movement of, of three main people that were in the main plaza with, with the domination candidate president, is that the leadership undersells them every time. What's wrong? That they what? That they, that the leadership undersells them. Oh. So it sells them out, right? So you have hundreds of thousands of workers from the electric union um, being sold out by their, their leaders. You 
Russian guy behind Salinas or behind Carlos Slim and behind uh, the owners of Televisa and Telazteca, the two major um, television chains. So basically, all all the right strings. This is the guy behind it, and he got kidnapped. And some people say, well, he kidnapped himself. Some people say that the, the Revolution Army did it, that the FARC did it, and everyone's pointing fingers. But basically, they came out that he was kidnapped. That was easy. I'm not sure if he got paid ransom or if he just negotiated it. But with that came a release from from a group still unidentified saying that we know it's like the front for the new culture, revolution front for new culture or something, some form that like the Tala or something like that. And came out and said, Well, we know who all your main players are and we have we're we're able to kidnap any one of them whenever we want if we're not if you don't let make headway. So but since then there hasn't been any movement on that either. It's a question of how much circus South to not necessarily be in direct immigration lines. And but they are severely affected by by the cultural difference and what that means economically for them and you see uh, a lot of conditions of poverty and that kind of thing.
it's for the major players in the cartel in the cartel industry. But it's more, and it's even seen in the public as it's more of a um, these people didn't want to do what the government wanted them to do anymore. So that's how they got it, type of thing. Rather than oh, we actually got them and it was all heroic and pristine and opposite of what they did all this. Yeah, but um, the biggest part of it is that. supposedly took control of Juarez, it was announced like three hours earlier by, by, by the State Department in the U.S. And Mexico didn't even know it had gone down when it got control. Um, are doing good, doing favors for the people. I don't think we're in Pablo Escobar time anymore. And these people were just cutthroat. And um, the only thing I know is that Supposedly rumors and urban legends or whatever that the Chapo Guzman or even leaders of the other cartels when they go into uh, a restaurant to take everyone's cell phone and then a pen to take for everything. Um, 